Good morning, everybody. My name is Peter Damo. I'm from uh, Romania. Uh, I work with the Association for the Development of the Romanian Social Forum, as well as uh, with uh, trade unions. Actually, I'm a regional trade union leader in uh, uh, education in Romania. And uh, in capacity of co-organizer of uh, this seminar, with uh, Transform European Network and uh, Zagreb Subversive uh, Festival organizers, which I want to thank you for, for the support of hosting the event. I would like to draw your attention just uh, in a couple of words uh, about uh, the logic of organizing, the logic and the purpose of organizing this seminar here, and of course about a few technical or uh, uh, problems related with uh, the organization that is going to, to happen today. So this seminar is actually a follow-up project uh, which is linked with a seminar which we organized last year in April in Bucharest, Romania with the support of uh, the same Transform European Network and of the GUE NGL uh, European Parliamentary Group uh, which was uh, related to the national question in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, the main idea of this seminar is to take this event to the next level. That is to critically exposing and challenging the neoliberal paradigm of dividing people, the fabric of society and even the states so as to secure political power by means of exploiting the national question throughout Europe. In terms of uh, the program, I would like just to say that uh, we have three panels and we would like to have it organized if you agree with this structure. Have the speakers which are listed in the, in the program deliver their speeches anything between 15, 20 minutes, it depends if we have three or four or five speakers, and then give at least uh, one hour for discussion, questions, and uh, uh, whatever related to, to, to the topics uh, discussed. <clears throat> I would also like to ask you to circulate this uh, list uh, of the participants in the room to have you signed as participants. Thank you. I would pass the, the microphone to Walter Bayer, uh, in capacity of representative of Transform European Network, uh, who are the, the main sponsors of uh, this project, last year and this year as well, to give the opening speech. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, frankly speaking, I'm uh, not used to this kind of inaugural speeches, uh, so I will be uh, very brief. Uh, I want, first of all, to express my gratitude to uh, Peter and the Association for the Development of the Romanian Social Forum, uh, to the GUE NGL group, which actually is the left of the left group in the uh, European Parliament. Uh, and, of course, to the organizers of this wonderful subversive forum. I see amongst us Rechko and Igor, who do this uh, tremendous and, and wonderful uh, job. Uh, Transform is, since a couple of years, uh, supporting the subversive forum as well as it uh, participates or helps staging uh, particular events in its frame. Uh, so uh, this particular seminar on the national question, I think it's of outstanding importance. The European Union currently undergoes an unprecedented crisis. Uh, the other day I read in an Austrian newspaper an interview with Yves Dacor, who is the General Secretary of the International uh, Association of the Red Cross, telling that uh, his organization starts to uh, reschedule uh, and restructure its programs 
in order uh, to uh, make a focus on the countries of the European South, which are threatened by uh, that what he literally calls a human catastrophe. Now I understand that talking about the particular uh, problems of the countries of the European South uh, may sound strange to uh, people from Central and particular Eastern Europe as they experience a deep economic crisis uh, since uh, many years and in a certain way uh, they anticipated uh, the forms of politics which are imposed on countries of the European South. Nevertheless, uh, this uh, new development, the austerity policies and the authoritarian way in which they are imposed on the peoples uh, of the European South show that we are in a new historical period with new uh, political uh, challenges. And um, one aspect of this crisis is the loss of political legitimation for the project of the European integration. But to translate this complicated term, loss of legitimation for the European integration, uh, you also could say that there is uh, a crisis in international relations, meaning in relations between uh, nations. And this objectively creates the basis for the rise of a new right and for the rise of uh, xenophobia and uh, nationalism. And this is uh, what we have to cope with. And uh, in order <clears throat> to put together theoretical tools for the analysis and uh, to generalize experiences which are made in different parts of Europe and in different regions of Europe with their particular culture and with their particular uh, traditions. Uh, we are keen uh, to uh, have uh, this discussion with people who are experts uh, on these questions and who can uh, help us to figure out more precisely and more concretely what is at stake. And uh, with uh, these short introductory remarks, uh, I would like to give the floor back uh, to Peter, who is going to moderate uh, this uh, morning's uh, session. And hopefully, we will have an exciting, interesting, maybe controversial dis discussion uh, in order to know better how uh, to cope with these uh, historic challenges uh, in front of us. Thanks for your patience and your attention. Please, Peter. Thank you, Walter, for the introductory speech. I would directly pass the floor to Catherine Samari for the first presentation. I remind you that we try to stick to around 15 minutes per presentation, more or less, uh, so as to give the possibility of discussion uh, after the presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be involved in that discussion, as I will be also involved in the uh, forum uh, uh, and the 16 uh, organized by Transform on uh, Balkan within and out the European Union. Uh, I will not concentrate uh, now on that issue. Uh, for the discussions. Uh, I would like to precise with what classes I want to contribute to the first uh, uh, discussion, which uh, is uh, about the left and the national question. Uh, which left? I am, uh, and here I, I will speak not as a member of uh, an association like ATTAC yesterday, but as a, 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 a militant involved in, uh, in parties and political activities since uh, I'm a, I'm a Marxist dinosaur, <laughs> half a century. So I will, uh, um, I will speak of the, the kind of uh, political culture, debates, and dealing with the national question within Marxist, a specific Marxist uh, tradition, and even uh, within a specific, uh, what is called also Trotskyist, that this anti-Stalinist uh, tradition, uh, where etiquettes, be it the etiquettes of Marxism or Trotskyism, is not sufficient to deal with that, 
So I will uh, deal with the, the, the Marxist and national question. I will say that uh, there are different currents uh, within Marxism. Uh, one current I will not speak of and I don't recognize myself in, but which is uh, really existing and still existing. Uh, uh, so we, we have to debate uh, with uh, the people, Congress, in, in recognizing themselves in such a current. Consider that Marxism uh, uh, is focused on class issues and that all uh, transclassic uh, uh, issues like national issue, feminist gender issue, and so on, are petit bourgeois or uh, uh, secondary uh, issues, and that uh, the, the, the main Marxist approach of national issues is to say uh, the proletariat has no nation, and uh, that uh, the, the anti-capitalist revolution will solve everything and build the framework for unity, universal unity of the proletariat. So this is not uh, my kind of Marxist culture. So I belong to a second kind. The second kind, which was uh, within the, the, the type of fourth international I'm involved, and the fact that it is an international, international is important, uh, led by Ernest Mandel and so on, well, uh, is pluralistic, which means uh, that there are a pluralistic approach of, of those issues. But the dominant, so I will divide uh, briefly a very sharp a presentation of two aspects. First, uh, six points very sh uh, briefly of uh, methodological approaches uh, within that current on national issues. And second, the, uh, as I was involved concretely uh, within the, the Fourth International on the Yugoslav conflict, uh, some aspect of what I've learned about the Yugoslav issues and how uh, we, did, uh, we dealt uh, with that issue. So the two points. So the first points are six very sharp uh, methodological, I would say, uh, uh, aspect. And I must refer, and, and, uh, of course, to uh, Michael Levy uh, and also to Michel Warszawski, who is here from this very same family, who have produced a lot of uh, 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 assets uh, for uh, the understanding and dealing with uh, national issues. So the first aspect uh, is, uh, was illustrated by even Michael Levy, uh, book uh, with, uh, uh, which was written with Claudie Veil on Marxists and the national question, which was to, 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 to deal with the national question as a real theoretical, political, programmatical issue to be studied uh, with uh, historical contexts, evolution, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, therefore uh, uh, debates. Uh, and in that book I'm referring to uh, is presenting the different currents within Marxism dealing with that. Second point, uh, so the first point is that the national issue is a real uh, theoretical, uh, programmatical issue. Second point within my tradition, uh, well, we had the dominant uh, sympathy, I would say, within the Marxist to the experience of uh, Austro-Marxism uh, uh, um, and uh, to Otto Bauer. And uh, that is an approach of national issue as an historical, uh, 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 historical issue and the, uh, of the nation as a, a subjective, political, historical uh, um, uh, fact of history which uh, can live, transform, and die even. And uh, with a very rich uh, uh, understanding of that which avoided a very bad uh, Marxist uh, uh, tradition from Engels, for instance, dealing with uh, uh, so-called uh, non-historical uh, non uh, nation, uh, Romanian uh, in Engels, uh, Czech and Albanians, uh, because of uh, uh, the, the way uh, their history uh, was uh, uh, um, dealing or not dealing with, uh, with nation, where they, they were considered by Engels as non-historical peoples, because of a certain approach, dogmatic approach of, of, of nations. And um, uh, that was criticized, and I, I integrated that in my culture, by Roman Rozdorsky against Engels, uh, 
uh, stressing, like Otto Bauer, the fact that there are different histories, different genesis, and different uh, political uh, evolution of, of nations, so there is not one uh, nation which uh, could be defined as progressist and other reactionary as such in essential way, and so on. Third aspect, uh, the distinction between, and it's a, a question also of vocabulary to be clear in the debates, we uh, belonged to a, a Marxist tradition which considered that the national issue and nations are a, a, a reality which to, had to be distinguished from nationalism as an ideology. So uh, national rights, uh, national feelings also, uh, to, be, uh, to be respected, to be understood, to be analyzed, uh, but distinguished from nationalism as an ideology putting nation and national issue above everything else, above any other kind of uh, uh, social relationship, and even more, uh, building its own nation on the back of others and presenting itself as superior and better than the others. So uh, rejection of uh, nationalism, but not rejection of national issue, national rights, national proudness, and so on and so forth. Fourth uh, aspect, the need to uh, deal with national question in the uh, global uh, framework of a complex set of not only historical uh, background, but social issues, cultural issues, and so on. That is not to deal national uh, issues as such separated from, uh, from the context. And, um, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and on the Marxist point of view, to come back, and that is also something that uh, Yugoslav Marxists have uh, stressed, uh, in the, the former praxis school also on, on the question of Marxism, alienation, and so on, that Marxism is to be distinguished from a workerist approach, that to, to give back to Marxism its uh, humanistic, uh, profound uh, understanding, uh, which combines both the individual, individual issue, that is the emancipation of each individual, uh, so individual free choice, of belongings, of several belongings, and of, uh, and, and of involvement in different uh, sets of social relationships. Uh, but also, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, the combination, uh, uh, the, the, the fight as a humanistic approach uh, for Marxism, the fights against all forms of domination, all forms of oppressions, and not only class oppression, so class oppression, gender oppression, nation oppression, racism, and so on, to be combined in the complex set of issues, where we discuss the fact that it is not a fixed set in, in, in certain contexts, so uh, for alliance and combination and so on, but without, on my point of view, a, a, a hierarchy, but a permanent articulation to be analyzed, and uh, so uh, a rejection of abstract uh, internationalism, uh, which deny uh, 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 nation operations, and, uh, and also rejects of nations which would impose to individual uh, a specific belonging. And the general Marxist uh, uh, approach that a people which oppresses another one is not a free people. So that was also the first aspect of our culture. Five, fifth uh, aspect, the very uh, important distinction uh, uh, because the world is, is and, and the, the, the capitalist system world is, is, is not made of uh, an accumulation of equal nation but is structured the, uh, but it's not on, only for capitalism uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, uh, there are relationship of domination between nations that there are dominated nation and dominating nations and uh, so, uh, and, and there, Lenin, uh, that was also a part of a culture, Lenin was defending the right for self-determination in the building, for Lenin it was a political issue. He, he has the, the, the idea that the future was not for nation, uh, but for political reason, to, for the fight against the imperialist domination, and even for the, for the issue of unity 
of different workers of different nations, the, the, the need to recognize the domination and the need to accept and defend the right of self-determination was a key uh, programmatic issue and uh, uh, the Fourth International has integrated its, this in its program, the right for self-determination, free self-determination, to be distinguished from the answer. Self-determination does not mean that the, 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 the answer that you fight for is to build each one it, uh, ethnic nation or separatism as the, uh, the, the, the answer. But self-determination, free choices, with an articulation which was also given in our culture uh, for uh, Marxist being in dominant nation and dominated nation. In dominant nation, putting the emphasis on the fact that the, there are minority uh, nations oppressed and on their rights to separate. But on the dominated nation, Marx is putting emphasis on the need to alliance with the working class within the dominant nation so that the unity of the, the working class against the bourgeoisie in, uh, is combined with the fight against the use by the dominant nation of oppressed, uh, dom dominated one, and by, by Marx is not to be identified with dominant uh, oppression, is to, rec be, uh, is to uh, con concretely recognize a self-determination. And last point here, um, which means, of course, uh, the, the first means in France, for instance, fighting against colonialism, fighting our, against our own imperialism and dominant nation and ideology that is in, especially in France with the French Revolution, uh, making a colonial uh, uh, revolution with so-called uh, civil, civilized uh, uh, components of the French uh, nation going to civilize the colon Colonized, uh, uh, colonized people. So we have to fight, and we always were involved as militants against this type of, uh, uh, of behavior, even within the, the workers' movement. Uh, so strongly defending self-determination and against our own uh, bourgeoisie, against its own nationalism of dominant power uh, within imperialist relationship. And last point on socialism, uh, as uh, general, that is, um, the, there was in the, the among Marxists a different view of what will be the future. Certain, like Lenin, I would say, uh, or uh, some others, would both recognize the right of self determination as a political issue and so on, but consider still the national issue as an issue of the past, as an issue of capitalism, uh, coming from the past or so. But that the idea was the uh, in the future socialist uh, uh, development, and uh, at the beginning, I think of the Yugoslav uh, experience that was perhaps uh, also uh, an hypothesis, at least among uh, Yugoslav Marxists. That is, that with the building of a, a new uh, a, a new set of relationship and uh, and proletarian emancipation and so on, then the national question will become a secondary one and disappear. And uh, 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 I also belong to a part of the Marxist uh, current which do consider, like Trotsky did, and like Rosa Luxembourg did, uh, the national issue, uh, I all, uh, also said, uh, uh, separate from nationalism, but the national issue as a richest the diversity of nations, the diversity of culture, the diversity of languages, and so on, uh, of histories as a, a, a riches. That is a long standing. Bon, then briefly, uh, some lessons of the Yugoslav issue. I have time or is it for? No, I must finish. How, how long? Three more minutes. Three more minutes, okay. So on the Yugoslav uh, issue, uh, briefly two points. Uh, first, what I, uh, I think uh, has as to, to, to be learned out of uh, this uh, Yugoslav experience, the Titoist evolution and the, the, the dealing through Cardell, um, uh, or especially uh, uh, involvement and so on, the distinction, which is very important on the European issue, the distinction between notions for uh, uh, the, the question of rights, the distinction between citizenship uh, uh, as uh, with uh, objective uh, uh, rules and rights 
universal one, which permits to combine the, the, the necessity to give universal rights, whatever be your nation, whatever be your religion, whatever be your language, and so on. And uh, also concretizing specific chamber for that. And uh, uh, the pity is that uh, in the, the Yugoslav system, there were a chamber for, uh, uh, for self-management for, and for nations at the, the local and, and, and uh, republican level, not at the federal, um, uh, not uh, at the federal one for the uh, self-management, but I mean in the European uh, uh, construction, I, I will uh, believe that different chambers uh, are uh, necess necessary in distinguishing a parliament with a, a universal right of citizenship, whatever be your nation, and specific rooms, specific councils, specific chambers to represent uh, the, 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 the different nations in their historical subjective evolu evolution, which could uh, defend their uh, specific uh, cultural rights and so on, with certain veto rights and so on. So, the, but in the Titoist tradition, as the post-Titoist uh, dealing with the national question, the 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 the, the, the notion of narod as opposed to citizen, the, the 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 notion of nation people as opposed to citizenship, was a free choice among. Uh, a certain uh, a, a quantity uh, of a possible uh, uh, recognized uh, nation, a free choice. Uh, and this is very important against imposed choice. You have to be a Serb or a Croat or a French or something. So the free choice was very important. And in that free choice, a possibility which is open for our thinking and future, like Otto Bauer said, that you can combine in yourself a combination of free subjective identity, and you can feel yourself both as a, um, uh, as, a, as a French or as a Serb or as a Croat, as a Yugoslav, as a European, as a universal citizen, uh, you see, with combination of, of, of rights and belongings and, uh, and uh, cultural uh, uh, identities. The, so this is very important, but of course didn't solve the, the, the question on the Yugoslav, uh, uh, on the Yugoslav uh, uh, concrete historical building of the non-Slav nations, that is the Albanian issue, and which would have been better solved at the Balkanic level, at the European level, uh, with equal rights for all, uh, <coughs> for all nations. So that's one point, the distinction. A second uh, point, uh, and I'll finish with this, the question of self-determination in the, in the Yugoslav issue, which was not clear uh, at all, because it combined two kinds of subjects. Who, who and what did, it, what did it mean in the conflict? What, what, do you, what means the right of self-determination when you are in a, in a complex situation where there is, um, well, I, I don't think that there was a, a strictly dominant nation, like in the first Yugoslavia, for instance, or that it was a colonial kind of construction. So how do you deal with uh, that <coughs> structure uh, uh, in, in, in the process of crisis? Do you maintain it by force? No. I think no, but that was the... the thing. So you have to recognize the, the right of separation. But then the debate, and I leave it for the for the debate because I have no more time and I can come back in the discussion to express how I was involved in, in campaign in the Yugoslav issue with the following principle. Uh, we from outside uh, didn't want, even if we have lots of sympathy for, for the Yugoslav experience and we would like it to be maintained and broadened and, and enriched and protected and, uh, and become Balkanic and so on, uh, we, will, we, we defended the right of self-determination of all peoples. That was the first. Against any forced uh, 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 reaction, an armed reaction to, impose, to maintain it. Uh, second point, we didn't choose victims. And what was the, one of the points, which by the way for the Jewish issue all, is also a, a point, that is you can be uh, here dominant and there dominated. And you can be uh, today dominated and tomorrow dominant and that you can be here uh, an aggressor and here victims. 
And so uh, the, the, the general and systematic, programmatic, concrete way uh, I uh, 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 developed myself in, inside the fourth international campaigns in the Yugoslav issue was first, self-determination belongs to people, not to NATO and not to dominant uh, 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 power. So we made a campaign, neither Milosevic nor NATO, self-determination for all people, the three. Mm -hmm. and, and not choosing victims, but defending all victims, being Serbs in Croatia, being uh, 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 Croats in, in, in Serbia, being and so on, in order to, fa to stimulate the unity of all people. Sorry to be long. Thank you. Thank you, Katrin. Thank you, Katrin, for this in-depth uh, theoretical presentation, as well as practical one. I pass the floor to the next uh, contributor, which is uh, Stipe Čulkovic. Sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope that what I will uh, be saying will be very uh, will be com complementary to what Katrin has just said. So I will not um, I will not discuss nationalism in in, in these uh, abstract or general terms, but um, I'll try to to um, to talk about it in uh, in the very concrete context of of the uh, ex European Union and the crisis we are witnessing now. So um, the first thing one notices when one when one um, looks at the history of the European Union or the history of, of um, the narratives around it, the official narratives around it, is that it is often uh, emphasized uh, um, that uh, the project of the integration of Europe, the project of the European Union, is a bulwark against na uh, nationalism. So one often even hears that uh, the, the, the catastrophe of the Second World War and, um, and uh, what it resulted in, uh, that this was, of course, a, 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 a consequence of, of uh, chauvinist nationalism or fascism and so on and so on, and to, uh, that the only chance uh, the European nations have for, for survival is by unifying, by transcending this nationalist uh, um, logic. So, um, but if we skip from there at the crisis, and if we look at how the crisis of the Euro European Union, of the Eurozone, is presented in the media and, um, and generally, we see, well, there is, of course, the talk about the European crisis, the Eurozone crisis, but imme what immediately follows is, of course, a discussion of the Greek debt and the German surpluses. So, um, what one sees here is that, um, that the, uh, the European project, the really existing European Union, uh, despite all its uh, claims, <clears throat> is um, is not not really transnational in its in its architecture. So there, are, um, one could see that also uh, uh, in the debate about the euro bonds. So there was um, the euro bonds. One could argue that would have been a step a, a step forward in terms of integration. Um, um, so um, a, serv a, a form of um, um, of. Uh, of transcending the logic of of of, um, of the opposition of, of national um, of the na national methodology of, of thinking and um, and um, and well uh, this focus on national uh, economies. Well, if one looks at what is truly transnational in the European Union, it is um, it is above all the the, um, the unified uh, market. So uh, the market is 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 truly is truly um, uh, the one uh, instance and the mechanism not only which transcends um, the question of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, nationalities, but it is the, the prime, uh, primary mechanism of integration. And uh, if one looks at uh, what this uh, in fact means, then uh, one realizes th this is a very peculiar form of integration, an integration not based on, on coordination uh, um, uh, in, in terms of um, uh, through democratic processes, but the market, in fact, the, the, the form of integration the market allows, and the only one it basically knows, is integration through competition. And um, we all, of course, know that the underlying theoretical argument for, the, uh, for this is uh, rooted in neoclassical economics, which believes that 
because um, the market integration necessarily produce, produces the, the best of all possible outcomes for everyone involved. Uh, I believe that, uh, at least here, one, one doesn't need to criticize um, the underlying um, uh, logical faults uh, and, and, uh, and uh, assumptions in that. It, it should suffice to, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to look at the empirical reality of the existing European Union, uh, and there one realizes that the market integration has not produced uh, um, the optimal outcome for everyone, but rather it has produced uh, winners and losers, it has produced polarization, it has produced a center and uh, a very discernible periphery. And this, of course, is no uh, coincidence. Uh, we know that um, capitalism, uh, that uh, capitalism's uh, uh, logic, this competitive logic, is fundamentally antagonistic. Uh, and, it is, uh, and we can see that it uh, asserts itself um, through competition and as competition, and competition on all levels of social relations, uh, as a competition uh, um, of uh, capital against capital, uh, different unities of capital, as Marx has said, uh, the capital class is a, is a class of hostile brothers, um, as a competition of capital against labor, as a competition within the working classes, a uh, competition for jobs, and also a competition um, of um, different national economies. So uh, we, we hear that in, in, in um, this is also, of course, um, a very important aspect I'll come back to. What one can discern now uh, is that uh, depending on which, which of these antagonistic relations, of these relations of competition one emphasizes, one gets a completely different kind of politics. If you, um, uh, and th this is, of course, something that, um, that's, uh, I will not go into here now, but maybe in the discussion we can, we, we can um, uh, discuss this. And another point I will come, come back to here is, of course, that not all of these antagonistic relations are uh, on equal footing. There is, uh, um, one, is uh, one thing one has to, uh, to bear in mind is this very specific structural weakness of labor in these relations. And, of course, this structural weakness of labor is, uh, is a necessity, a, a structural necessity for the reproduction of, of, of capitalism. Um, and this structural weakness um, uh, um, is a consequence of, uh, precisely of the separation of, of the, uh, the working classes from the means of production, that is, from the means of existence, um, which then makes it dependent on the wage, and on the wage, um, on the wage as, its, as its sole uh, source of, of, of income. <laughs> But I will come back uh, why, why, this, why this, um, this is fundamental point about capitalism is also a very important um, uh, um, strategic point for, any, uh, for the development of any kind of left policy, uh, including um, the left responses to, to the um, European crisis. But if we look now at the level of the competition of, um, uh, of national economies, well, there have been, uh, there have been um, economists uh, interpreting the, the, um, the, the underlying mechanisms, the, the causes of the uh, European crisis, as, as precisely one deriving from uh, neo-mercantilist uh, politics of the center uh, against the periphery. But what does this in fact mean? Uh, uh, how does this neo-mercantilism or this, this div division between the center and the peri periphery manifest itself uh, uh, within societies? Well, for one, it is a competitive drive um, to attract uh, capital in, in, a free, in, a, in an integ integrated ma market with free uh, uh, capital flows. This means that um, um, the politics of, of national uh, economies or the, or, the, or the government is one of, of trying to attract capital, which often um, uh, means um, a drive towards um, uh, um, lowering, um, lowering of wages and so on and so on. But for the periphery, it has meant, the ones who lose out in this, it has uh, meant, uh, of, more often than not, deindustrialization. Um, or, as, as uh, Ricardo Bellafiore, for example, has put it, um, uh, the, uh, in fact, the center has, has exported unemployment to the periphery through, uh, through this competitive um, um, drive. Uh, so, um, on the one hand, we get an accumulation of surpluses, and on the other hand, an accumulation of debt and unemployment. And this is, uh, as we all know, this is the, 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 st the structural predicament of the European Union at, at this very point. <coughs> so, um, this, of course, is, has also been theorized, uh, the, uh, the logic um, uh, to which um, um, 
the politics, uh, politics of, uh, national, uh, of, of national governments um, is leading towards, in Germany it's called Standortwettbewerb. So this is the, the, the idea of the competitive um, national economy. And uh, what one immediately sees, of course, is then that then this competitiveness, this, this need, in, so if you have a fundamentally in a, capital, a capitalist uh, uh, economy, um, where the, the role of investment uh, is, is in private hands, where, where basically the, the production uh, and reproduction of society depends on, on the profit motive uh, and is uh, in, in private hands. This leads basically structurally favors uh, any policies that will, that will favor uh, uh, in an investment climate and economic growth. And thereby you get uh, you get the, the narrative of uh, competitiveness, of increasing competitiveness as a national interest, as a national interest. This is what, what we hear um, all along. But what this means uh, effectively in capitalist society is the universalization of the imperatives of capital accumulation. It, it is presented as a universal. And um, so it is said, uh, we need, our economy needs uh, to prosper, uh, uh, we, need, we need to, uh, um, to increase competitiveness, we need uh, to be more productive, we need to be, and so on and so on. And this is of course not, not only uh, ideology, there is, um, uh, it is at the same time um, the condition of plausibility of, uh, uh, of um, of corporatist ideologies of any kind. So this identification with my company or with, with my national economy for many workers is not a purely um, a, a, a question of false consciousness, but on the sh in, uh, on the, uh, at the short term level, this, uh, this uh, derives from a, a really from an um, uh, immediate material interest to, to preserve one's job or, or to, 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 to prevent losing one's job and so on and so on. Uh, in the long term, of course, this is uh, fundamentally um, a self-defeating uh, uh, tactic. Um, and this, of course, opens up uh, uh, insofar as, as um, in, uh, the competition of national economies for, to attract capital uh, at the same time means a pushing of the working classes of these national economies into uh, a competition. This, of course, very easily, so th this provides, I would say, the, the structural framework or, as I said, the condition of plausibility uh, of xenophobic and social sh chauvinist uh, narratives. Um, how, much, how much time do I? Okay. One more minute. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, let's skip this, um, some, some of this. Um, and um, so what does this mean for the left? I, I would say the left uh, has, to, um, has to be careful to, um, uh, be, uh, of two uh, potential uh, errors or dangers. One is um, to buy completely into this, uh, and, uh, and in Ljubljana, maybe in the discussion I can, uh, I can come back to this, but there has been a lot of talk about the national bourgeoisie, whether or not, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, what the role is, and whether one needs the national bourgeoisie, what uh, its relation is to the comprador bourgeoisie, and so on and so on. This is, of course, um, here should be quite obvious, but, but um, so there is this, of course, this, uh, this, uh, this danger to buy into this, uh, um, into this uh, lo logic of, um, of uh, um, standard web web or the to um, internalize completely this um, um, th this logic of, of uh, competitive national economies. But at the same time, uh, um, uh, the, uh, it, it, it does not suffice to promote a, a, a declarative or abstract kind of uh, Europeanism or European universalism without um, this, uh, with uh, complete disregard for, for the reality uh, the, the most, most uh, people are fi uh, finding themselves in, uh, social re reality. W one must never forget solidarity does not fall from the sky. Uh, and it is not a question of voluntarism uh, or of, of any avant-garde or, or, or political party. It, doesn't, it is not enough uh, to tell uh, the workers of Europe uh, you need uh, to unify. We have to, um, and this is where I come back um, uh, to, to an earlier point, but one must never, uh, the, if, if what, what really, um, uh, if what, if we really want to put an emphasis on, on, on the class aspect of this, rather than, than the, 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 the different levels of, comp uh, of, uh, of antagonisms, rather than the um, competition between national economies, one must always start from, uh, from the, uh, the, the most fundamental uh, question, and that is the question of the structural weakness of labor with regard to capital. And the left has uh, to, to do everything uh, uh, to prevent its, its deeper weakening. And neo neoliberalism is, in fact, to a large uh, extent, an, um, an assault to 
uh, precisely to in increase the dependence of of uh, of, capital, uh, of of labor on the, on the wage as as a sole source of of, of income. Um, it is the dismantling of, of spheres of relative autonomy, of relative security, um, of uh, a social reproduction. So this. Well, I should uh, maybe maybe there is time to elaborate uh, on some of this uh, later on. So thank you. Thank you, Stipe, for your presentation. We pass the floor to Ratko Mochnik, our next speaker. Uh, thank you. Um, I will um, continue the. The flow of uh, presentations as uh, it was initiated by Katrin and uh, Stipe. Katrin has uh, proposed a general horizon of uh, the national question in, uh, in the Marxist tradition. And uh, Stipe has um, outlined the, the importance of uh, national, national ideologies and constructions in the present. Uh, I will uh, try to approach uh, the middle term between the two, and that is the emergence of nationalist ideologies uh, in Yugoslavia and, uh, during the 80s, and the uh, um, uh, readjustment or re-articulation of national ideologies um, under the pressure of um, processes that we commonly call uh, globalization. Uh, so uh, my starting point are two contradictions. Uh, one is that uh, uh, nationalisms and national, neo-national constructions, the new states, are processes of fragmentation that are um, taking part within, within dominating processes of uh, world uh, uh, integration. So uh, we have here um, a case of what is in classical Marxian terms called uneven development. Um, the second contradiction is that, uh, res that uh, resurgence of a 19th century ideology at the end of the 20th century definitely poses a problem. And this is, again, um, uh, reminding us of the classical Marxian topos of historical uh, repetition. So at the first outburst of nationalisms in Yugoslavia between uh, 65 and uh, 71, that is between the economic reform and uh, the purge of uh, techno-liberals, um, the praxis, uh, so, uh, philosophers and sociologists, uh, especially those from Zagreb, Rudy Supek, and uh, others, uh, proposed uh, basically three theses about nas nationalism, and I would uh, re-examine uh, those early analysis of uh, nationalism with uh, what happened later and what we can see in the retrospect. Uh, so the three theses um, of the praxis thinkers were that um, nationalism is um, an ideology that uh, supports itself, that derives from uh, the affirmation of petty bourgeoisie as the new mass class of Yugoslav socialist society. The second, uh, uh, second uh, thesis was that uh, the rise of petty bourgeoisie um, uh, was uh, linked, was uh, an effect of the systemic failure of Yugoslav socialism. And the third thesis was that nationalist ideology as a construction is the reverse side of, bureaucrat of bureaucratic dogmatism. Their common features uh, were, according to praxis thinkers, fetishism of the state and collectivist mentality. Uh, now, in uh, res retrospect, we can propose the following three secondary theses about nationalisms that destroyed Yugoslav Socialist Federation 20 years after praxis analysis. Um, uh, the thesis one would be that Yugoslav nationalisms of the late 80s were the ideological, what's called in, in German Verbindungsmittel, ideological glue 
um, tool of uh, integration uh, that horizontally united uh, political and uh, ideological bureaucracies, the leading two types of bureaucracies under socialism, and that ver uh, the Verbindungsmittel that vertically secured uh, ideological hegemony of those two uh, dominating groups over their populations. Um, this was um, the ideo ideological political response to the movements of the 80s. Uh, during the 80s, the, uh, the domination of political and ideological bureaucracies was severely challenged by the workers' movements, by the so-called the movement, the strike movement of white, white uh, strikes, that means strikes out, uh, outside the established system, and by uh, the new social movements that um, appeared all across the world and also in Yugoslavia and other socialist countries at that moment. So um, nationalist ideology was, and construction that followed, um, um, undercut both the workers' resistance and the alternative socialist movement, uh, the alternative uh, social movements. Uh, the second thesis in retrospect would be that uh, nationalist fragmentation was the local response or maybe better the local adaptation to the policies of the Euro-Atlantic political-economic centers, re that means Western Europe and United States basically, uh, the, to those policies of the Euro-Atlantic um, core, center, core, uh, core centers um, which, with which those uh, core political economic centers were trying to oppose, to, to, to stop, to block the demise of their world system hegemony. So the post-socialist countries in, 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 in Eastern Europe uh, uh, were sucked into this, uh, into this, um, into this um, process of the demise of Euro-Atlantic uh, uh, hegemony. Uh, the material and the third thesis would would be that uh, the material effect of practices mediated by nationalism uh, was the uh, was the constitution of states that are apparatuses of peripheral dependence managed by comprador bourgeoisies. Um, Stipe has uh, touched the question of national bourgeoisies. I think that at this particular historical mo uh, moment. Um, 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 uh, it is now impossible, the creation of national bourgeoisies in the sense of post-colonial uh, dominating classes is impossible in, uh, in, in uh, at least in Balkan region and probably in most, in most uh, post-socialist countries with the exception of Russia and maybe the big ones. So in other words, a restoration of capitalism entails transformation of socialist ruling bureaucracies into comprador bourgeois classes. Um, the pertinent question that opens here is that, uh, in a certain sense, this situation is, um, uh, is repeating, mutatis mutandis, of course, the situation between the World War II. Uh, before the World War II, uh, the Balkan region um, was uh, periphery of semi-periphery, was becoming periphery of um, of uh, Germany and Italy, of Nazi Germany and fascist uh, Italy. So uh, we are now becoming uh, a periphery of, um, uh, of European Union, Union that, sink, that is sinking towards the position of semi-periphery in, in the world context. And that's a very dangerous situation for people who live in such places. Um, it it, uh, it uh, definitely provokes the resurgence of authoritarian regimes. So uh, if we now, in, uh, in, in the light of retrospective um, uh, wisdom, um, um, look at the praxis thesis, we can see that the thesis number three, nationalism as reversed uh, uh, ideology of bureau bureaucratism, that this thesis has been verified. The two reverse sides were unified under the domination of nationalism and bureaucratism contributed state fetishism. The thesis too, as to the systemic failure, has been verified to a surprising degree. Systemic failure of socialism has caused 
Yugoslavia and other socialist countries in general uh, to be sucked into the systemic failure of Euro-Atlantic hegemony. So uh, this thesis actually uh, uh, has much larger and more extensive uh, uh, importance than praxis uh, philosophers and sociologists thought. Now, as to the thesis one, which is the most interesting, uh, uh, and speaks about the relation between uh, nationalist ideology and its social bearer, its social trigger, uh, um, uh, this thesis is, uh, is problematic. Uh, uh, but uh, we can see that the praxis thesis is definitely Lukacian. Uh, so it may be, uh, uh, and that's my final exercise, it may be interesting to to, to, to start by defining nationalist ideology as petty bourgeois ideology in Lukacian terms. If we do this, then we see that as petty bourgeois ideology, nationalism is ideological representation of social totality as elaborated by a class that cannot form a relation to, so, to society as totality. So it's a paradoxical ideological construction because translated into Lukacian terms, Praxis' description of nationalism yields this structure. It is the representation of social totality, in quotes, by a class that, by, uh, for its objective social position, cannot relate to society as totality. Now, what means socia so society as totality in the 80s and in the 90s? It means world capitalist system, and which means that the new the, the old new dominating groups failed to relate to the objective, to the really existing social totality, which is world uh, capitalist system, and replaced uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, this uh, uh, or supplemented this lack um, of, of, of relation to the social totality by a phantasmagorical um, construction of the nation. Uh, anachronism of, of nationalist ideology resulted in the narrowing down of the socio-historical scope. So the lack of its scope was supplemented by, the, by, by various myths. The myth of Europe, the myth of Euro-Atlantic integrations, which means e European Union and NATO. Uh, and those myths, of course, were conveniently suggested by um, imperial ideology, neo-colonial ideologies of the time. Uh, speaking about the free world, the civilized democratic West, etc., which again is interesting, but we, I'm not going to, to enter into this, that the, the imperial or con conquering ideology of the 80s and the 90s was a recycling of Cold War ideology in a historical situation where Cold War was over. So we have this historical repetition also in the core. Uh, or in the ex core of the world system. So what nationalism is, uh, and this is my final point, what nationalism is in the, at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 21st centuries. It is basically a rearticulation of an old bourgeois ideology and its uh, constructions. Uh, the old bourgeois ideology of, nation, of the nation and the, the, fall, the constructions, the, real, uh, the material existence of this ideology, the nation, the nation state, is a formalistic construction following from the, the mutual autonomization of the economic sphere and juridical political sphere. So this is uh, Marxist Jewish question, basically. Um, now, at the end of the, 19th, of the 20th century, and now, nationalist, uh, this, what we call nationalist ideology, substantializes, makes a substantialist um, uh, operation. Uh, it, it makes, operates substantially uh, the for, basically formalistic nationalist uh, nation uh, ideology of, uh, of bourgeoisie. So I, th I think that what we are dealing with is a rearticulation re 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 that actually results in identity reconstructions and, ide and not in national constructions. And identity reconstructions have a contradictory uh, uh, a contradictory internal immanent structure that makes for their strength because this contradiction is non-antagonistic. On one hand, uh, well, identitary constructions and ideologies are uh, ideologies and constructions of discipline and uh, control. So they can serve on one side, on one side 
uh, comprador bourgeoisies to reproduce the domination, which uh, was described by, by Stipe as um, attracting capital and, uh, um, and uh, creating capital-friendly environment in, in, in local, in local uh, etatistic constructions. Uh, and on the other hand, I, identitary ideology is a spontaneous response and adaptation of households in the situation of growing, increasing insecurity and heterogeneity of income of those basic economic uh, unities. So what this identitary, uh, uh, um, identitary ideology on the basic level consists of is not is not only nationalist uh, ideology, is not even predominantly nationalist uh, ideology, but are uh, elements, elements of ideological control and discipline that are at hand. And what is at hand? It's religion, it's ethnicity, it's patriarchalism. So we have an identitary uh, ideology and its constructions that works both ways. It reproduces dominations and it, it is a form of, of of adaptation of the dominated groups to this comprador domination uh, in, uh, in, um, in peripheral countries. So it's a kind of very unpleasant, uh, I mean, a very an ideology that's hard to deal with because it's authentically embraced by people who are dominated. Uh, and I think that the left response is very classically, we should, um, we should attack the conditions, the social historical conditions that make for this ideology and its constructions. So uh, the, the response is uh, social action, uh, while ideological polemics with, ideology, with these ideologies of identity uh, is necessary, but will not bring a result by itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brasco, for your very interesting and challenging presentation. Uh, we will go to our last contributor. Walter Bayer has a contribution, and I would like to ask you to stick to the 15 minutes, 15 minutes <laughs> maximum, and then uh, we will try to, to open uh, the discussion on what has been said. Uh, in the 90s of the last century, uh, there was the first wave uh, of the debate on uh, nationalism and nation and uh, emblematically there were two books uh, published, uh, one by Etienne uh, Balibar who according to the zeitgeist uh, of the 90s uh, regarding uh, nation uh, as a social construction, as an illusion, as um, uh, but as an illusion of the particular kind which creates realities and in particular which creates the reality of state. And at the same time, uh, a book by Eric Hobsbawm uh, appeared, who of course uh, also uh, as um, Baliba opposes, uh, opposed any kind uh, of nationalisms, however from a, a different angle, and deemed it as appropriate to recall, and I quote, the first noteworthy attempt to subject the issue to a dispassionate analysis, namely the important and underappreciated debates <coughs> among the Marxists of the Second International on what they called the national question, <coughs> involving the best minds of the international socialist movements, uh, namely Kautsky, Luxembourg, Otto Bauer, and Lenin, to name only uh, a few. And uh, similar to uh, the presentation um, of uh, Katrin, I want to uh, start by referring to these uh, uh, discussions. Um, actually, um, the one focus, one focal point of debating the national question in the uh, labor movement uh, was uh, the debate in the Social Democratic Party of Austria, which was a Social Democratic Party in the environment of a multinational state. Uh, it was uh, founded in 1988 and uh, already in 1997 it was represented in the uh, uh, parliament 
of the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire. And in uh, 1899, it uh, published um, in their Congress, or it adopted in their Congress in Brno, uh, a program on uh, nationalities, which then became the uh, point of reference for the national political debate among uh, European socialists, um, amongst them Otto Bauer, Luxembourg, and Lenin. And just to recall the five points uh, which were uh, put forward by um, the Social Democratic Party of Austria at that time. First, uh, Austria has to be uh, reformed to a democratic federal state of nationalities. Second, uh, in place of the historic crown lands, nationally demarcated, demarcated self-administration bodies uh, should be created. Third, all governing bodies of the same nation take care on uh, their national uh, issues uh, and concerns completely in an autonomous way. Fourth, uh, the rights of the national uh, minorities have to be uh, guaranteed. And fifth, the Social Democrats do not recognize any national privilege and therefore, uh, demand, uh, for, uh, and therefore also the demands uh, for a state language. You may ask now, this is a historical document, what has, to do, what, what has this to do uh, with Europe? So allow me just a few sentences uh, uh, on Europe. Usually, uh, we look uh, at the European integration, which took shape at the end of the 50s from a socio-economic point of view only. Only in the course of the crisis, we started now to extend the analysis to institutional aspects. However, we rarely think about that, that the European integration is also a specific arrangement of national relations which distinguished the Europe after the war from the one before the war. This means that national questions existing inside uh, in Europe were not abolished, but frameworks were created in which they would be dealt with and uh, so goes the saying, under the exclusion uh, of war. Looking at this empirically, and above all contradictions stand out that with this idea, um, a market uh, was created with about 500 million inhabitants, a GDP of 16 uh, trillion uh, US dollars, which is to 80% realized internally which makes the European Union the biggest domestic market in the world, inside of which transnational cooperation, financial markets, as well as uh, European institutions set decisive basic conditions. In one word, Europe, as represented through the European Uni Union, is also a factual reality. But at the same time as the European Union um, structured by financial markets, transnational corporations, and uh, European institutions constitutes a factual reality. At the same time, social systems, uh, workers' rights, economic regulations are organized on the uh, state's level, uh, on the state's level, which uh, normally is referred to uh, national states. Um, and I want to look on this uh, contradiction uh, from a slightly different angle, uh, as Stipe did. Uh, looking at this setting, uh, you have to consider that uh, that what is called economic regulation, welfare state arrangements, uh, labor rights, uh, takes place on a state basis which roughly absorbs between 40% and 50% of the uh, GDP used to be centralized and redistributed in, the, in this frame. And these regulations 
as a result of struggles under the condition where uh, capital uh, reproduction has been uh, nationally, na national state-wise based, conflicts now with the reality of this uh, European setting of transnational cooperation, uh, financial uh, market, and so on. And it's uh, noteworthy to say that um, while um, nation states absorb uh, about 50, 40, 50% of the GDPs uh, produced in, the, in this space, only 1.2% of the cumulative GDP uh, were, um, uh, make up the budget of the uh, European Union. In other words, the important problem consists in that, what, in that social politics regulatory legislation and material resources for redistribution, even democracy is historically based on the assumption of a functioning nation, nation state, while the constraints for these policies are set externally on an international, on an uh, European level. Normally people refer uh, to this as a structural, constructural defect, a structural flaw of the European integration. I prefer to call it a sort of a Hayekian utopia where the weakness of the super, supranational level is exploited not only to put enterprises in competition but also tax systems, social security arrangement, labor legislation, actually whole, uh, whole states in competition to one, or one, of, uh, to one another. This is one contradiction. The second contradiction uh, to which um, people rarely uh, refer uh, has to do with the social bloc which presently carries the project of the European uh, integration. In his brilliant book, The New Old World, Perry Anderson observes that civil society has um, developed throughout Europe. About 25% of the population indicate in opinion surveys that they have traveled to another country within the last 12 months. Culturally, two out of every three West European speaks a second <coughs> language. Well over a million students have followed courses outside their homeland. However, he points out, and I quote, if a genuinely European society distinct from the particular national community has crystallized, it is not shared equally by all inhabitants of the Union. Only a tiny part of the populations comprising 10 to 15 percent is deeply involved with other Europeans on a daily basis, while the vast majority remains firmly tied to the nation. In other words, those who materially benefit from the integration who interact socially most often across national borders and who have the strongest sense of collective European identity form an upper class minority drawn from business, government, high income professions and academy. A larger middle class has only intermittent contact with life beyond local frontiers, while the lowest classes have little or none. And then he writes, undeniably, Europe has so far been, at any rate, socially and culturally a class project. A clash of interests could therefore break out over it in condition of an economic crisis. And I, I would even say this is a sort of prophecy, as this book was published in 2002, if I, if I remember uh, rightly. Indeed, the European integration is in crisis. Indeed, with it also the arrangement of the national uh, relations which it incarnates. But uh, otherwise, uh, what this represents are not contradictions between nations, it's not the nations or the national contradictions which uh, are the causes of the crisis, but it are the economic contradictions of European capitalism and the policy of the neoliberal elites. However, that social contradictions, I prefer the notion of class contradictions, may appear as contradictions between nations, hints to a, a, a fundamental uh, a failure of the integration process, namely the lack of democracy in general and the lack of the national relations in particular.
And uh, by the way, it's sad to uh, read how um, unsensitive or even unsensible outstanding intellectuals approach uh, this question. If you look, for example, in the, in the, in the book of uh, Daniel Combendit, uh, he actually says, well, we are now in the state of post-nationalism. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this uh, state of uh, social development uh, is accomplished uh, by neoliberalism, but we have to swallow it. And if we have swallowed it, then at a later stage, uh, we can again fight for uh, a social Europe. And if you um, uh, debug for this kind of policies, you end up uh, in a, a class-based, elitist view on the European integration, which is uh, alienating uh, an always increasing part uh, of the populations and uh, of the working populations. Uh, so what, has, what can the left uh, say uh, to this state of the play? Uh, I uh, would say that uh, what the left so far has produced uh, in theoretical terms, and I refer to these uh, uh, historic uh, theories which were mentioned also in, in, in Katrin's introduction, actually there were three principal answers. One answer has been the answer of Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg simply said, um, nations will become obsolete with capitalist development, the working class is progressive. Social democracy, uh, therefore, is not called to implement the right of nations to self-determination, but the uh, right of self de to self-determination de of the working class, the oppressed classes, the proletariat. Actually, also Luxembourg believed uh, that this would, uh, in a not so far future, lead to the complete disappearance uh, of the languages of the smaller nations. Um, and finally, uh, the whole culture of humanity will speak one language and will belong to one uh, nationality, uh, which she basically endorsed. Uh, the second uh, answer uh, by the classical left has been um, formulated by Lenin. We must accept more or less unconditionally the right of self-determination and the right of self-determination includes the unlimited right of political separations of uh, nations which are governed by alien uh, national uh, bodies and they have the right to uh, the formation of independent national states. Uh, now, regardless, uh, if uh, we uh, support the right of self-determination or not, I would say that this, uh, um, the consequent execution of this right of self-determination was one of the reasons for the uh, political uh, imbalances uh, in the national arrangement between the two wars. And uh, that's why I would say that uh, uh, this idea of an unconditional support of the right of self-determination um, by the social democracy has at least failed to the same degree as the idea that uh, uh, nations will disappear in a, in, a, in a near future. So then we come back to the uh, third answer, namely the answer which was given by Otto Bauer and the um, Austro-Marxists, namely the right of national autonomy uh, as the appropriate ex, uh, expression uh, of self-determination. I only uh, want to draw your attention to one modification uh, which the Austro-Marxists uh, proposed, namely to replace the territorial principle, meaning that uh, each uh, country, uh, each nation has the right to its own state on its own territory, must be uh, complemented by a personality uh, principle which constitutes the state not as a territorial uh, authority but as a pure association of persons an entity which anyone can join, regardless of place of birth, of place uh, of residence, uh, that would involve that in a common state based on universal suffra uh, suffrage and proportional representation, power should not be assigned to this or that nation in this territory, but that nations of different character can coexist in one and the same territory. 
And uh, allow me to say that I think this is of uh, at most, at most political and practical importance uh, for the uh, present situation uh, in Europe and in the uh, European Union. You may uh, ask uh, for the reasons why the Austrian Social Democrats put the question in this way, while Lenin, Lenin put it uh, otherwise. And my answer is that the difference between the approach of the Austrian Social Democrats and Lenin lie in the simple fact that Lenin wanted to smash, to destroy a state, while the Austrian Social Democrats want to gain hegemony in this state in order to make the working class governing, governing it. And I would think that this actually is the question uh, which is standing in front uh, of the left in Europe, namely to develop an idea how Europe can be governed in a democratic and in a social way. And um, finally, uh, from this kind of considerations, uh, I draw five uh, political conclusions uh, regarding uh, Europe, which may be, uh, which may be useful uh, for um, concrete thinking uh, how uh, the left uh, could contribute to find a way out of the crisis. First, Europe cannot be imagined as a unified state on a larger scale, for Europe is not a nation, and if it ever will be, one remains questionable. However, what we can think of is a European Union as a commonwealth of European nations based on popular sovereignty and subsidiarity, meaning that competences between the Union and the states are shared in a way that the Union takes only care for matters which the single states cannot handle. And this may be important ones, including social and ecological standards, market regulations, bank supervision, redistributional policies, even uh, European public services and European social benefits. Second, political legitimacy must be based on a constitutional law which defines the norm of the juridical space, including the division of competences between its different levels and institutions. A universal European citizenship based on equal rights for all residents and a unified equal and proportional suffrage for the European Parliament which we currently uh, do not have. Third, the European uh, Union adopts a charter of uh, the rights of nations and national minorities establishing the right of self-determination, may they be big or little, the right to decide freely and democratically on their affiliation to a particular state or to the union, guaranteeing the right of every individual to exercise cultural national rights and to choose freely the national community he or she prefers and uh, he or she prefers and to exercise cultural and national rights on the basis and in the common juridical frame. Fourth, strengthening the rights of parliaments on all levels vis-a-vis -vis the execu executive institutions, implying granting uh, the European Parliament in the frame of defined by subsidiarity, the full right of deciding on European budgets, on European laws, and electing the European Commission as its executive. And five, no European institution, neither the European Central Bank, nor the Court of Justice, nor the Commission must be allowed to function as a quasi-law-giving institution. The Pact on Stability, the Fiscal Pact, and the Governance Package within the Monetary Union have to be repealed. The European Parliament resumes the full responsibility of the European monetary policy. It exercises the control of the European uh, Central Bank. Last remark, uh, how may this come about? Uh, some of our comrades proposed the idea of uh, launching a constituent process uh, right now. I remain doubtful towards this idea. I think that this kind of revolutionary refounding the European Union passes through the defeat of the present policies by the European institutions and the national states meaning the defeat of austerity policies and the authoritarian way of imposing them. 
However, let me finish by saying that um, as far as the left is uh, concerned, there has been uh, much uh, reference made to Altiero Spinelli, an Italian communist who in 1944 uh, drafted uh, a European manifesto, the Manifesto of Vento Tene, was the idea of uh, creating a European federation. But what is uh, rather rarely referred is his idea that the European revolution, which he was aiming at, has to be a socialist revolution, giving back the dignity to the working populations as one of the conditions for creating a real federal democratic uh, European political space. And I think we should uh, remember this when we are talking about how to create uh, a left alternative vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis the dramatic European uh, crisis uh, we live in these states. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Walter, for your interesting presentation. And uh, I would like to open the debate without losing any minute now. I think this is uh, at least of the same importance as the presentations, if not more, as the presentations uh, taken place up to now. So it's up to you to come up with questions or comments or whatever uh, you think uh, you, can contribute uh, you can contribute to what has been said. I already see uh, one, two, three, four. So, uh, I saw you and. Yes, yes. Okay, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Gaspar Tomasen. I'm coming from Budapest. Uh, so, I'll just rather continue. Uh, what I heard from you and um, I would draw the attention uh, in a more or less critical way to something I, I've written about but uh, which I still think it's important. You know, nationalism in its original shape in the 19th century has been an heir to classical republicanism in the sense of attempting to create political equality. And uh, it has been historically the most important attempt of doing that. And it has been the instrument, actually, of creating exactly that. Since most European states have been, of course, aristocratic states and dynastic states based on the opposite to, to classical republicanism, nationalism appeared as a disintegrating, corrosive force that has been resisted by the predecessor of the European Union called the Holy Alliance and by Metternich and so on. So in the 19th century, nationalism was, if you wish, on the left in this respect. In this respect. Now, the trajectory of nationalism that it has become the ideology of young imperialisms mostly German and Russian, uh, of course has changed the whole historical uh, uh, role and position of nationalism, which has been transformed in such a way that actually the original character, the emancipatory, egalitarian, and statist, all three characteristics of classical nationalism, have all but disappeared. This is what I called in various writings uh, uh, the fact, which according to me is a fact, that nationalism is dead and its place has been taken by something I call ethnicism, the differences empirically can be highlighted very simply. If you regard the nationalisms of the second half of the 19th century, what did nationalism do? Well, create great nation states out of small principalities. Italy, Germany, well then, of course, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, so on. You know, it was big nation states, supra-ethnic nation states with still a national calling based on a dominant culture and a strong state and the social mobilization that was on the whole anti-aristocratic and in many cases anti-ecclesiastic. 
well, this is gone. Well, this is gone. So, you know, look at the ethnicism of today. We did exactly the opposite. Uh, unmake, unmake large nation states and making them into small principalities like the one in which we are the guests now. And, uh, and you see, these, the ethnicism in contradistinction to nationalism is lacking many things, but mostly what I would call the civic dimension. At the center of classical nationalism, it's all with these ambivalences and ambiguities, stood the equal citizen, the empowered citizen, and the bourgeois, of course, you know, the autonomous bourgeois, secular, active, expansive, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, basing uh, its cultural and political strategies on a collective kind of inequality uh, where collective individualities within which political equality reigned were fighting what then became the First World War. Now, this is, the whole thing is gone. If you look at the most corrosive and dangerous ethnic movements anywhere, you would notice that they're not aiming at the creating of a new commonwealth, a new state. There's no properly uh, uh, speaking political mission within the new ethnicist movements. It is sheer hostility, it is it is an idea about conquering territory, making an identity between past, territory, space, uh, 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 social identity, and so on and so forth. It has no explicit political dimension. This is, of course, parallel. This is parallel to the disappearance of a number, or, or the weakening of a number of very important political institutions, such as political parties, such as trade unions and such as the socialist movements as such, right? So the, the la political landscape of even 1947, it's not available any longer. So those of us who are somehow the successors, sometimes the unhappy successors of the international workers' movement, must realize that both the institutional order has changed the nature of please the please try and be briefer, please. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> yes, me, uh, I think. Uh, thank you, Mr. Michel Warszawski, and then we have a colleague in the second yeah. row. Please try and be briefer. I will be brief, and because I I was asked to ask a question, I will finish by a question. Uh, we all have social functions and a social place in our society. And it can be identified by more or less complex sociological analysis. But we also have identities and consciousness, or I will say consciousnesses, which are not uh, the direct uh, reflection of our position in the society. It is multiple. It is dynamic, and it can change even in a short time. National identity is part of it. If we take, I want to, ah, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Michel Warshavsky from Jerusalem. Uh, if we take the Palestinian people, for example, a case I know from close, <clears throat> in less than half a century, it has been passing through three stages of strong community identity, collective identity. First of all, it was Arab and not Palestinian. It was very secondary to be Palestinian. It was part of an Arab belonging, an Arab identity. Only in the late 60s, the Palestinian, specifically Palestinian dimension became central in the identity, not losing the Arab dimension, but somehow over-determined by the Palestinian reality, the reality of this part of the Arab people and the Palestinian identity. Today we may be at the eve of a third self-identification, which could be part of a Muslim, broader Muslim identity. We don't know yet, we are at the beginning of a huge change 
maybe to return to an Arab identity with the impact of the Arab revolutions and the long term, because for me it's a long term revolution on the, Arab, on the Palestinian identity. So identities are changing quite rapidly. Uh, I think in the debate, in the historical debate you mentioned, uh, uh, in the socialist movement, uh, Austro-Marxism and the Bund positions win the battle somehow against Rosa Luxemburg and even Lenin, although Lenin was more sophisticated a little bit. They won the battle by emphasizing, and especially the Bund, I was educated in a very classical, like uh, Catherine, in a very classical, uh, critical Marxist, but very Marxist and very Leninist conception of, for me, the Bund was the enemy. Today, maybe it's the age, uh, I, I am rereading the debate, and I am not so sure that Lenin was as right as we thought when we were young. Uh, the relative autonomy of national or community belonging is much stronger than what classical Marxism and Leninism was attributing to. Uh, I would like to warn against a concept which reappears in the political literature today, the concept of false consciousness. What does it mean, false consciousness? What is a real, you can say a false class analysis. Okay, it can be a sociological debate, but false consciousness, consciousness is a reality which uh, is made of many things. It can bring to false co political conclusions, but it, it, it is somehow meaningless. And I would like to finish with a question to Catherine. Uh, as an activist in a very specific, okay, I, we know that Yugoslavia is her new motherland, all Yugoslavia is her new motherland, but uh, Catherine, you are from France. And France is a very, very specific model. Uh, a model which is destroying any identity any specificity, a curse, in, in French, a bad word is communita communitarism. Putting an emphasis and maybe a value on the belonging to a community which is more than simply to be a citizen of France. I remember, I finished, I remember uh, Mrs. Badinter, a feminist, very Frenchy, uh, intellectual and activist, telling me in a public uh, uh, debate, in France there are only citizens, no communities and even no genders. There is no a women citizen. We are all equal 65 million citizens, that's all. And all the rest is your private identification, but in the public sphere, we are only 65. My question is, do you believe that this model uh, can last in our period of opening of the borders, of crisis of the system, which is also a crisis of identity. Thank you. We have a colleague in uh, the second row. Please be short. Oh, thank you. I will be very short at the expense of possibly being very crude. Uh, my name is Vladimir Runkowski Koritz. I'm from Marx 21 in Serbia. And possibly for this reason, I will have problems with Austro Marxism. Um, and that's the question that I want to pose. I will slow down. Sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, the question I want to pose is basically, even though I'm from Serbia and I can't really talk about the European Union, um, the question within the European Union is being posed very concretely. Uh, austerity is being uh, transmitted to particularly the countries of the periphery of the European Union in the name of Europe. So uh, nationalism is spreading in the countries of Southern Europe you know, or the periphery uh, like Ireland. Um, insofar as people stay in the European Union, it is out of fear, but most people uh, seem to <laughs> or appear to uh, identify Europe with austerity. Uh, now, where is Lenin and, and uh, you know, uneven and combined development and so on? Is, um, is that the pace with which we fight austerity in the countries of the periphery will be different to the pace and intensity of fighting austerity in the countries of the core? 
can we honestly wait or ask the people of the periphery to wait until the struggle is everywhere at the highest level? Or is the question of self-determination of nations within Europe, or if you like, with their right to secede from Europe, one that the left should pose on the table, whether or not it is the key tactical question at the moment is debatable, but nevertheless, surely it is one of the questions we have to pose, because if we don't pose it, then, like in Italy, um, it will be the likes of Silvio Berlusconi or a, a comedian who will hegemonize the question of austerity from the right instead of from the left. So surely the question of Lenin's right to self-determination is still very relevant. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I have a very unpleasant mission to try and cut it short. If there is maybe one more question, yes? And then uh, let's uh, try and give the chance to the panelists to give their answers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned uh, the historical development of nationalism in different European countries, I won't repeat it. But the question uh, of today in Croatia is how they, the government through the uh, educational system, uh, invent new nationalism through different uh, subjects such as Croatian language, such as history, which is more mythology, mythological uh, invention of uh, national history as if nation existed through centuries, which is false totally. And the third, the most important element of this new nationalism is religion through catechism. So this is very important. If you want to stop nationalism, to put catechism out of the school system, the uh, last uh, uh, survey show that nationalism in Croatia is bigger now than 20 years ago during the war. And then young people who were born in new Croatia, not in Yugoslavia, uh, have more hatred against Serb and other nationalities than it uh, was before the war and during the war. So nationalism is actually, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Mocnik said, an invention of a dominant class, a dominant group, in order to continue its domination. Does, and they need followers who are blind, who are blind and believe in a kind of hierarchy national great saints, great savior, messiah, whatever. So, how to stop this anyway? Uh, uh, to any person here who would like to uh, enlighten us, how to stop this rising of nationalism? Not only in Croatia, we have a golden dawn in, in Greece. You know everything in, in, in Romania. So, the, the problem is real, and I would like you just to find some solution. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Let's give the floor to the panelists and uh, have their answers. I think Catherine should be the first. Yes, I don't want to be too long. Uh, first, I would say. Um, uh, I have a, a remark on the question on the, the European issue. I think we must defend in an absolute way the right not to be in and the right to live. Huh? Not to wait for uh, everyone to agree. But the real question, uh, uh, I believe, uh, is uh, what are we fighting for? It's not the question of nation, but of rights, social rights, question of austerity, question of public services, question of language. Is the best way to defend those rights within your nation, or will you better defend it in another framework which you have to destroy as a framework? Because the European Union, as it is, we, we, we have to destroy it to build something. But. Uh, the concrete uh, conditions for the fight uh, is the, the political debate for the left, is the, the, the best way for you building a unity and, and the fight 
to leave it or to, to fight within it. So that is for another debate. Then there was a question uh, raised by, by Michel um, on, on the French um, uh, model. Of course, I'm fighting uh, very uh, sharply against this kind of Jacobinist, unitarist concept of the French model, where even in the European uh, Council of uh, Europe, uh, the French uh, uh, dominant uh, forces uh, didn't even sign the, 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 the recognition of diversity of languages, and uh, of course in, in the, the French territory. They are uh, praising the, progr the historical progressive aspect, which is right, of uh, uh, what, said, uh, uh, what was said before also in the 19th century, the building of nation state against par feudal particularism and the, uh, uh, the unitary aspect at that time uh, having a, a progressive aspect uh, dimension, but was both uh, an oppressive uh, a, a construction, unitarist construction uh, against the diversity within uh, France, and which is used also in the Yugoslav uh, uh, framework and European framework, uh, claiming that, uh, you see, you have to choose between universalism, the French re republicanism is supposed to be universal, because uh, you, uh, all, all citizens are equal there. Huh? So an abstract universal uh, uh, model against nationalism, which would be, like you say, any kind of communitarism. Uh, and then uh, I would uh, argue in favor, and I, I finish this, uh, of the combination, uh, a combination of, uh, of possible expression at the uh, European level also and within each uh, uh, nation, which means uh, also, perhaps to combine with what you say, the question of uh, not only a, a, a parliament which could reflect the necessity of citizenship, of universal citizenship, against uh, ethnicization of political life, ethnicization of rights, but uh, a specific uh, 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 right of separation, of course, and, and chambers of representation uh, for different uh, nations in order to defend uh, their, their right in that uh, uh, context. And for the debate, the next the debate, I, I will only say that I, I, I've, uh, I don't think austerity policy is only imposed on the peripheries. Uh, so that is a, a very big point for the uh, uh, strategical uh, discussion. But for next. Thank you, Catherine. I think uh, Walter uh, has a point on uh, one of the que at least one of the questions. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I, I want to stress uh, three points. One is, I think this is very, very important what you said, that austerity is not only imposed in the countries of the periphery, because uh, not only empirically, to understand what's going on in Europe, it's necessary to understand that this is a class project to do away the achievement which the working classes has uh, gathered in the last 50 years. It's about taking away rights, it's about taking um, the doing away with the social and welfare arrangement. Actually, it means pushing back the working populations in a state in which they were between the war and maybe even, even before. And this is very important also in strategic terms. Uh, strategic, strategically speaking, I would say, of course, the countries of the South must not wait for, for uh, the movements in the North. The political challenge which I see is how to combine uh, the high level of struggles in the South with the so far lower level in the North. Meaning what would happen if Syriza took the power, for example. Uh, how could this lead to a series of dis disobediences? How could it contribute to the failure of the uh, currently prevailing policies, which must be defeated, which must be defeated? How could it, it for example, contribute to a shift uh, of the power uh, to the left in France and in other countries? But what I and I agree, of course, with, with the idea that uh, if a country like Cyprus decided to leave the Eurozone or even the European Union, it's the right of their populations to decide, and the left has to defend this right. And when they have decided to do so, then the left has to, to, to defend 
that they do it under the most favorable conditions possible. Um, but what I also be deeply convinced is that in a situation in which markets are Europeanized, in which bank corporations uh, are Europeanized, uh, in which transnational um, finance markets set the rules for each country, uh, you need to have a political space on the European level. And what the ruling class thinks about the political space on the European level is simply to be described with this one point percent uh, European budget. They do not need a European political space because their European political space is the market. The working class needs politics. The working class needs regulation. The working class needs, um, uh, needs democracy. And the last remark is of theoretical uh, character. Uh, yes, uh, Michael, uh, Lenin won apparently the battle because he captured better the spirit of the, of the time. But historically, I would say that the idea uh, that the, the, the only guiding principle of national policies of the left uh, should be uh, the right of separation and self-determination has failed in my opinion. It has to be complemented by other considerations, but what I think that the real contribution of Lenin to the debate on nation is, um, and this is, let me say, a, a difference, uh, I try as much as I can to avoid the, the term of national identity. What Lenin contributed to the debate was the question of national difference, meaning that in each nation there exist at least two nations. He thought there were two nations because capital and labor, bourgeoisie and capital, I would today say it's of course much more complex. We are much more complex individuals. But uh, what actually is the case is that when you deal with national questions as a leftist and a socialist, I would say that um, dealing with national questions means to find arrangements and solutions which are so democratically, so transparent, that um, the class struggle can appear or the other social struggles can appear as purely as possible so that they're not distorted. Yes, and one, one last sentence, because I think it's also important to discuss it when it comes to nation in Europe. We usually, when talking about uh, nationalism, we always think uh, on Hungary, uh, on the danger of nationalist movements in the European South. I tell you very frankly, I believe that the most dangerous uh, nationalism in Europe is the danger of nationalism in Germany. And the link uh, wages a, a, a huge struggle a, a against it. But as I see the situation, um, it is so that you have now in Germany two competing uh, strategic long-term uh, considerations. One consideration is the one of Merkel, authoritarian neoliberalism, austerity policy, German model generalized in the European Union. But there are a lot of people now uh, seeing that this is not sustainable and it will not work. So that now come others up and say, well, if this does not work, let's get rid of all these things because we as German capitalism would do better without being connected to all these uh, countries in the south who are, I don't want to quote anything. And I think this is, uh, this is what we have to consider. If this happens in one big country, it would of course trigger the same reaction in another big country, and it would trigger um, reactions in the smaller countries. And I would say that this is an aspect, an aspect of the national question we have to look at uh, much more thoroughly than we were used to it, because we are in this severe and dramatic European crisis in which everything can happen and in which every danger and every ghost of the uh, 20th century may come up again. This is, in my opinion, the challenge which has the left to cope with. Thank you, Walter. Rascal? Uh, I would like to make two points. Uh, one uh, is um, to support um, Walter Bayer's um, skepticism about self-determination. Um, during the disintegration of Yugoslavia, pe uh, persons who identified themselves as Yugoslavs uh, did not have right to self-determination 
and there were several mu millions, definitely more than Slovenes or Kosovans. Um, but the other, the other point is about uh, political agenda in Europe. Uh, we definitely have to introduce the division of powers into European government uh, governance, uh, which means that uh, we need to create a political space in Europe, and we cannot, uh, and we need an agent, a subject that will help to create it, and that's a pan-European country, uh, a party, political party. Um, the other thing is, I, uh, I agree with uh, Walter Bayer that a realistic way to, 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 to change, to transform uh, European construction is uh, to take power in the nation states. But again, uh, the experience tells us that uh, even uh, in, um, condition, under conditions of extreme, uh, of acute crisis, uh, the left parties were unable to, 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 to have good parliamentary results in, in the Mediterranean Europe. So, um, again, I think that uh, we should uh, think about creating a, uh, uh, an international uh, uh, coalition of parties or, pa uh, or kind of network uh, that would support national uh, efforts in the framework of bourgeois parliamentarism that by definition is not, uh, is not favorable to left initiatives. Thank you. Stipe? Uh, all right. We will close now and we have a delay of, by my, uh, by my watch, of 16, 17 minutes and it's exactly the delay by which we started this. I ask you to be so kind and come back uh, in 15 minutes, so as the next panel goes on by clock. Thank you very much.